whatever you are saying on a consistent basis, you're programming your subconscious. So if you're saying things like, oh, I'm such a failure, or I'm not doing enough, or I'll never get it right, this is what your subconscious is being programmed with. And then that's what you'll continue to manifest, that you're not doing enough or you aren't enough or you'll never get it right or you're a failure. I've heard people use, I'm so stupid and all these things. Even something so simple as I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Of, I don't have any time. I have no time. <laughs> I have no time. And, and I think that we're going to run the spectrum on this because it's really important because there's really harmful talk. Yeah. And then there's other harmful talk. It's those subtle nuances that really uh, give depth more to the awareness that you bring into your, into your space, into your life, and into your spirit, into your body. Welcome to the Let's Be Real podcast, genuine conversations for authentic living. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Lisa Allshafer, empowerment life coach and author. And I'm Sandra Pariser, health and wellness entrepreneur, truth speaker, truth seeker. And today's episode is about the power of words and how language can impact your stress levels. So this is something that you and I have discussed a handful of times. And I like to say, you know, if you really want to get to know yourself a little better on a deeper level, take a look inside and follow your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And this is going to go much, much deeper into what that actually looks like, the power of words. Yes. Oh, don't forget. Like, subscribe, and share if you're so inclined. We really appreciate that. Yes. So there's a quote uh, from Reverend J. Martin. I don't know who you are, Reverend J., but thanks for the quote. Mm -hmm. uh, and his quote is, words are free. It's how you use them that may cost you. Mm. And that's what we're going to talk about today is what words might you be using that are costing you in some way and really increasing your stress level? Because... Language is a powerful, powerful tool. And with any power, anything that comes with power comes with much responsibility. Mm. <laughs> and to, to really look at that and see if how you're using the power of the, your words and the tool of language in a way that's really empowering you and not exacerbating or um, it's either exacerbating or it's alleviating your stress, depending on how you use it. Absolutely. So this is going to be a really fun deep dive. That's right. Where would you like to start on this one? Well, we'll start with the power of self-talk. Mm, my because, favorite, which yeah. is why I brought it up in the beginning. Exactly. Because <laughs> that's, that's where you start. That's where you start because yeah. oftentimes, just like everything else we've talked about, what you're doing in here, you can be doing out there as well. You know what you what's you know how you speak with others could be how you speak with yourself and so forth. But the power of self-talk. Um, is really important because whatever you are saying on a consistent basis, you're programming your subconscious. So if you're saying things like, oh, I'm such a failure, or I'm not doing enough, or I'll never get it right, this is what your subconscious is being programmed with. And then that's what you'll continue to manifest, that you're not doing enough or you aren't enough or you'll never get it right or you're a failure. I've heard people use, I'm so stupid and all these things. And it's or like, even some, or I'm sorry, even something so simple as I'm so busy. I'm so busy. You're going to create more of. I don't have any time. I have no time. <laughs> I have no time. Yeah, we're going from, and, and I think that we're going to run the spectrum on this because it's really important because there's really harmful talk. Yeah. And then there's other harmful talk. It's those subtle nuances that really uh, give depth more to the awareness that you bring into your, into your space, into your life and into your spirit, into your body. Yeah. You know, and when I'm in a coaching session, well, just in general, but mostly in coaching sessions, I pay a lot of attention to the languaging because it's, you know, like the Freudian slip. <laughs> Well, it's not exactly like that, but sometimes it is, um, where people say things and I am getting a window into their belief system mm -hmm. because I can hear what it is. And then I'm like, okay, if this is something, especially if they say it repeatedly, if this is something they're saying repeatedly, then this is why they're getting this result in their life. 
but because they're so close to the language, it's so automatic that they just don't even see it. They don't yeah. hear it. Yeah. And most of the time you're disconnected from that. Yeah. You don't even, you're not even aware that you're saying some very powerful, powerful yeah. uh, belief systems and structures and words to your, your, yourself. Right. So that harsh criticism, it can affect your, you know, your self-esteem, your self-confidence. Um, it can go into, you know, self-blame and really being harsh and aggressive with ourselves. So you really want to replace it with kinder and more compassionate internal language. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about um, also about exaggeration and catastrophizing because there's it's just different levels of kind of the same thing. But even with um, negative self-talk, you may be saying something that's more exaggerated than it actually is. So mm -hmm. the impact of exaggeration in our languaging and how we use our words is really significant too because that too, all of this can be automatic. And things like um, whatever the reality is of the situation, and then you put your filter on it. And if you use exaggerated words, it could be things like, I'm totally overloaded with work, or I'm swamped with work, right? Or this is a disaster, <laughs> right? This is, you know, something that's very exaggerated. And then it takes whatever the situation is that definitely it's going to be challenging clearly, but it just amplifies it to an even bigger challenge just because of how you're describing it and how you're seeing it instead of bringing it down to size. This is where making a mountain out of a molehill can come into play that saying, right. And then, um, and then also when we use the words, especially in communicating with others, like, well, you always do this or you never do this. So these extremes also, can be through this process of really exaggeration in our language. Yeah, it's it's different levels. So I mean, it can be on a low end. It could be on a, you know, it, it's breaking patterns. You know, just like what we were talking about on our last podcast and identifying what those look like. And um, and then and then like you've said to me, and I think we've said on the podcast many times, catch and correct. Just catch it. You know, this is a a whole process of learning deeper elements to, to yourself mm -hmm. in all of this. So, you know, paying attention, catching it, the exaggeration can, uh, I mean, I'm kind of caught in a little bit of this right now and it's, and it's, um, but I'm, a, I'm aware of it. You know, mm -hmm. it comes down to my house, like just, I got to sell a house. Okay. I got to reframe the context in which I use my words. And again, that's something simple. That's not self-talk. We'll talk about that as we, we move forward because the self-talk is a is kind of a different thing, but it's the same thing. What you put out there, you're creating. And and we are creating our realities today in a way that I don't think, I mean, I've never been so acutely aware of the power of things like self-talk and the power of words and uh, patterns. And because now I see it in more of a a, a whole person experience and, and really being of service to others and heart-based and frequency. And it all, again, it all is, it's all part of it. It's all yeah. part of the magic of the human experience. Yeah. Well, even the, I have to sell this house. Oh, exactly. Right. Right. No, I don't. Exactly. Actually, <laughs> you don't have to. I and don't. <laughs> how, how many times, you know, might people use that? I have to, I have to. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of uh, someone I worked with, gosh, I don't know, maybe 17, 16 years ago, quite a, quite a long time ago. And she used that a lot. I have to, I have to, I have to. Uh, she was a stepmom in a marriage of young children. And she said, well, I have to do this and I have to do that. And she was, again, stressing herself out. She was very um, self <laughs> self-pressure a very high self-pressure person. And I said, no, you don't. Hmm. You're, you, if, if you look at it as you have to, you're removing something that's really within your power and that's the power of choice. Mm -hmm. You are choosing to because you can, you can 
walk out the door of this family and be in a different life. Yep. So you're choosing to stay. So then you get to choose to do all these things that you feel you have to do. If you don't put it, start to put it in the, in that premise of your power of choice that you're choosing to, then you're going to continue to feel out of your power. You will feel disempowered. One more, and just one more thing. It's um, so another way to say it is instead of I have to, is I get to also, mm -hmm. I get to, mm -hmm. I choose to. Uh -huh. And I, a lot of people get stuck. I mean, I've just experienced just that one. I have to, I don't have to sell this. I, and I know that yep. it's in, in, you know, picking out a couple other, um, just kind of situations that popped up over the last few days is that, um, I got a call from my sister and it was just kind of one of those, it's, it's sister, it's friends. It's, um, no, I don't have to be on this tennis team. No, I don't have to. Um, I don't have to be the poster child and do all these things for anybody else or, you know, all these things for my friends or have these responsibilities to family or actually that's not true. And so when I come from a space of, I really enjoy doing X, Y, or Z and, and, and all of that is my creation, right? So it doesn't matter what it is. Like I'm setting up my life. There's no, I have to's. Mm -hmm. There in, but you have to catch that because even the, the, the subtle nuances, like the overt got to catch yourself from saying is that really powerful negative self-talk that those words are something that you have to, if you're not aware of them, you, you have to start there because if somebody who loves you so much, like you with me, mm -hmm. heard me talk like that about yeah. myself, you'd be like, whoa what are you talking? That's not you. Like, and you're, you know, you're internalizing it. So, so those really harmful negative self-talk needs to just become more of a shine a light on that so that you can, you can catch and start to twist even what you say. And that's super simple to do. I think that's a good challenge for our listeners to, again, it's the follow your thoughts, but let's do it more intentionally to see if we can catch what it is we're saying to ourselves. Even if you, for those of you who are listening, even just pick one phrase, mm -hmm. I have to, mm -hmm. and choose to switch that one phrase because you might find, wow, I say that a lot. <laughs> it's just the awareness of it. First, it's like, wow, I say that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's just one place to start. When we can start with just simple steps, mm -hmm. it's going to last much longer. And then that becomes kind of a new way of speaking, even, okay, here's another one. A lot of people will put don't in front of something. So don't forget. Mm. And then how the brain works is it, it hears more of the forget than it does the don't. <laughs> so re use remember. Now this one, I, I shifted quite some time ago and e even periodically I'll go to the don't forget and then I'll just switch it. I'll catch it and correct it. And then I'll say, remember to pick up this or remind yourself that, yeah, or whatever. I mean, know? it's, it's the note. I yeah. just did it. You know, we were, we were sitting right before the podcast and it's, yeah. I'm not going to forget. I'm going to write it down. How about that? <laughs> you know, yeah. pick different, yeah. different, um, patterns, different right. habits. Well, and I, and also because I'm, I'm so tuned into listening when I'm coaching. So this is why, you know, some of the stuff just, it naturally flows into my own personal life because mm -hmm. I'm doing it so much in my professional life. Right. I try not, I don't do it out like if I'm, you know, um, socializing or something, I'm not going to be correcting people. <laughs> I'm not going to do any of that unless, you know, they're really close or something, but I might mention something. <laughs> no, I'm not like, you know, the 24 hour therapist or whatever. Um, so, well, no, the truth is you're actually super duper funny and you're really fun to hang out with because, <laughs> okay. because you have a really funny sense of humor. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, the other one that I might say to somebody in a session, if they, if I hear that I'm stupid or whatever it is, I'm like, do you want to be more stupid? No. Then quit programming yourself mm -hmm. with because what you're doing right now is by saying that you're actually creating more opportunities 
for you to do stupid things. Now, first of all, I am stupid is an is a feeling that's hooked into your identity. So first you got to make the difference. You can everyone can do stupid things. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean they're stupid. So when you tell yourself the I am, I am stupid, I am not enough, I am ugly, I am whatever it is, whatever mm-hmm. follows that I am. And then that's where you start, your language starts to hook into your identity. And then you believe that about yourself is that I am stupid. So the first step is to recognize I am is not the same thing as I do stupid things or I feel stupid. Mm. So get those I am, pay attention to where you're um, targeting those I ams, because that's, if that's what you want to be, then keep telling yourself you're stupid. But otherwise, why not just remove that word? Is that word really serving you? Hmm. No. 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 I have to. No, you don't. Mm-hmm. Not anything. Don't have to do anything. You know, and this comes back to uh, when COVID first came out, and especially with the with the the COVID shots. Um, and you remember this. We were still in Vegas at the time that the COVID shots started rolling out. And there was this period, I think it was between probably March of 21 and then kind of six months after that, where there was this maniac panic that you could feel with people, you know, either the pressure to get it or the desire to get it or the polar opposite, which was not to do it at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And you had these three interesting dynamics, but at the end of the day, they might've mandated this and mandatory that and you know whether you're in the service or working at the casinos we got a lot of friends do, do working at the casinos um but the truth is nobody was forcing anybody to do anything that they didn't decide to do now to you know what i'm saying like literally pin people down and you know strap them down and inject like nobody was doing that mm-hmm. so i mean that's kind of a, a an extreme example of something we've all actually lived through, everybody's lived through, whether they decided to, to, to booster or to not at all. We all went through it. And mm-hmm. whatever decisions we made are personal to us. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, it's nobody's business what we decided to do. Um, but we didn't have to, right? It's more empowering to say we chose to. Yeah. Do anything. That's just one example of it. So, um, But yeah, it's, it is far more empowering. And that's the goal is to get people to realize that we have such an amazing, authentic power that is coming. It's like, our spirit is like, please, you know, work this stuff out here because we got some work to do. And I really want you to be happy. I want you to be peaceful. I want you to, you know, enjoy this experience in your human body for as long as you can. Um, and so clearing out some of the, uh, these, these, you know, kind of negative programming thoughts, words that we say to ourselves so important. Yeah. Okay. So even the censorship of our words now, right? Yes. So we're really actually being called and tested. How much are you going to stay in your power or are you going to let your fear keep you from expressing what you really want to say? Mm Mm-hmm. And because we're in such a heightened environment around that, and there's so much censorship going on, whether we realize it or not. Oh, um, it's happening. You know, it's, yeah. Then it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just really looking at, are you going to let your fear prevent you from really expressing yourself for mm-hmm. what you believe to be true? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I just got off the phone with a friend of mine who, um, is a legitimate investigative journalist. I have a handful of them and the things that they, uh, research are, uh, dark, the darkness. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of my, one of my investigative researchers is moving away from that more into this type of conversation. Um, but my other friend is like knee deep in, it's like pushing out the truth and how much censorship there is. 
a censorship to the point where they're not allowed on YouTube. They have been kicked off all the platforms. Mm -hmm. Um, one of them is still kicked off of Twitter X, whatever. What are you, I'm still kicked off Twitter. I can't get my Twitter back. And, and it's like, okay, so if Elon Musk is really this amazing person and he really wants to bring freedom of conversation back into our, our human experience here, well, why am I still silenced? Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's legitimate. What am I saying? You know, but why am I still silenced? And so I was talking to my girlfriend and I said, you know, have you ever thought of maybe talking more higher consciousness? Like, don't you feel like all these dark agendas have already been exposed and, and now, but she knows so much about the human spirit. Like, and she interviews the best of the best of the best of the best. Like she's got connections to all of this. And I'm like, man, that'd be so much fun. Um, cause she's interviewed them. We've been on her shows and, and, and she, um, you know, it is something when you've literally been silenced mm -hmm. and you've had to scratch your way into the public domain, which interestingly enough, Lisa, you and I, you know, starting our podcast when we did with the message that we have. Um, I am so grateful. I don't care about agendas. <laughs> I mean, I see them. I know what they are. I care more about spreading and, and helping people find that frequency inside of us, you know, and the more we heal our traumas and this self-talk, by the way, is self is trauma. Right. It's just, it trauma is now one of those overused, I think words, but at the heart of it all, it is exactly what you and I are talking about really helping people really reach that, you know, here's one thing to do this week before we see you again, you know, like, Hey, follow your thoughts, find one. Wow. I'm saying this to myself. Youch. I wouldn't say that to a friend of mine. Yeah. And is that what you want to manifest is more of what you're now saying to yourself. Yeah. yeah. Now there are times that we need to uh, catch and correct because we might be needing a little, firmer talk with ourselves, mm -hmm. but just like with our kids, you don't go to abusive talk. <laughs> you, the intention behind it is to, um, perhaps move you out of a place where you're being complacent or you're being, you know, whatever it might be, uh, even afraid to make, maybe make a next step in whatever you're doing, whether it's your business or it's something personal or whatnot. So yeah, there are times we need to be firm with ourselves, but there's a difference between being highly critical and having a firm kind of self-talk to get us to move to the next level. Like enough of this, Lisa, it's time to do that. It's time to do whatever that is. That's much different than, gosh, you know, you're so stupid. Why don't you do this? You know, you've yep. been putting this off, blah, 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 blah. It's like, nope, you know, it's time. So come on, pull up your bootstraps and let's get going. Right? Okay, Lisa, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> oh, I got, you know, I mean, full disclosure, this is a, a journey that you're on, I'm on. And I'm, I did have to just kick myself a little bit in the tuckus and say, all right, Sandra, let's go. And I had this moment and everybody saw it. If you watched our podcast, I don't know, three weeks ago or whenever it was. And that was such a, I, I know for sure we're all experiencing this kind of level up, you know, it's almost like between the energies of what is literally happening cosmically, uh, astrologically, um, all of it. And we've got a lot of these energies coming off our sun that we've never seen before. And I mean, anybody can go just look at solar flares and it, it, you you go down a whole rabbit hole, but those are still, you know, because we are all energy and everything is connected, whether it's, you know, us to the flowers or the water or the, you know, I got a cat lurking around. So if you see a little kitty, kitty purring, she's so cute. She's a polydactyl cat. She's got six paws. I think she's lucky. I call her Polly. Her name is six paws. But anyway, um, we are all connected. So, and it's not just we, us here on planet earth. It is everything in the cosmos. We're all connected. We're all made of the same stardust. So when that energy comes off our sun, it's affecting us in some form. Me personally, from the research I've done, and this is just what my thoughts are on it. It's um, creating this really neat movement to, uh, again, 
more awareness into. It's leveling up. It's expanding our DNA. It's allowing us to break free of the chains that bind us. And the chains that bind us are negative self-talk. Um, you know, deciding or realizing that we're creating our reality. That's so powerful. So powerful. Yeah. I'm going to come back to that because I want to go back into, I want to finish this piece up about catastrophizing, but then about the influence of communication with others Mm. and not only how you speak to others, but how you allow others to speak to you. But let's finish the catastrophizing up first. My life is over. Yes, exactly. (laughs) I'm ruined. That's it for me. (laughs) I'll never, ever speak to them again or whatever it might be. Right. So it's, it's, or the friendship is over or whatever. You know, there might be times that it actually is, but it's just another fight. You know, you say this every time, or I'm not talking about you. I'm just generally general. Yeah. Every time you have a fight, it's over. Okay. So let's, let's pull it back a bit, (laughs) take a breath. And so forth and, and really recognize what you're saying. Cause I mean, especially people who live in a lot of drama Mm -hmm. tend to do this. There's a lot of drama, things are exaggerated. They can be catastrophizing and so forth, but you're also amplifying the worst case scenario through your words. Mm -hmm. And do you really want to do that? Yes. There's a challenge here. Let's let's look at the challenge. Mm-hmm. And instead of saying all those things, you can say, yes, this is a challenge, but gosh, you know what? I think I've been here before and I made it through that time so I can make it through this time too. Yep. I'm going to say, because I think we talked about this on the last podcast, which was Aurora with her friend and that whole big drama. Um, and, and so even just working with her to not catastrophize something that is really real. This is this little girl. They just need to be separated. Mm -hmm. There's no drama. The drama has already been in the past, right? So in order, because she's my daughter. So in order for her not to create that habit of catastrophizing things so that there's all, okay, if I just have the, then mommy's going to come to the rescue and she's going to get involved. And so I'm, I was very conscious of that lesson with her work because she can be pretty dramatic is to, we're just going to remove ourselves from the situation, had a conversation with the teachers, you know, cause I think when we did our podcast, it was, I don't think it had, I hadn't had a conversation with the teacher cause it happened on a Friday. Um, but yeah, just making sure, you know what, just so we don't create that pattern of drama Let's, let's just make sure, just keep them separate. Mm-hmm. And we have not said the word. Her name has not been mentioned in the house. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Easy way. I got a daughter who catastrophizes. Oh my God. Anyway, break well, the habit. Well, pay, again, it's paying attention as a parent, paying attention to the languaging that you both use to see if she's picking up some of that. Because again, it's oftentimes... It's through our kids that are reflected, our own languaging, our own behaviors, our own (laughs) belief systems even sometimes. And that's why kids can be like, oh, wait a minute, you sound like me. But we don't see it because it's so automatic until we hear it from our kids and it's Mm -hmm. like, oh. So it's just, again, just another check-in point. Kids are great check-in points to kind of see where we're at. The best. Strong reflection. So let's go into the influence of communication with others. And like I I just mentioned, how we communicate with others. Are we aggressive? Are we negative? Are we using the always and never languaging? Are we, you know, really like in our last podcast, you said letting people have it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Or because this is why the saying exists hurt people, hurt people. So when we're feeling hurt, we can come out in that defensive way and just lambast somebody with our emotional language. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's little knives that can come out of our mouths. Now that's one place obviously to look is what we're putting out, but what about allowing people to talk to you in that way? I've had people, I've lost, I, I lost one client because of how they were talking to me. I said, I'm not going to let you talk to me that way. That's just not going to happen. 
and we were done. It was a Zoom call, so I ended the call. <laughs> oh. I'm like, this is not uh, not going to work for me. Oh. Sorry, but they weren't there on their own. They were they came through someone else, and uh, as far as um, like a spouse, right? So they were reluctantly there in the first place, and that was one of the reasons they were there is because of the really aggressive. Uh, attitude and languaging that was going on and he he wasn't my client anyway i mean he wasn't a good fit for can me. i can i um ask you a question sure so um on the, along this line so obviously my kids they're such great mirrors mm -hmm. um there's a friend of one of my kids who it, it's just an interesting uh, parent dynamic so it works both ways. Typically, when you're watch what people say to you, I mean, harmful self-talk is not in my realm. Mm -hmm. um, but careful what either your spouse, you know, usually it's in a parent um, a partnership. Yeah. But it could also be what your kids and how your kids talk to you. Mm -hmm. Sure. So start, because I have seen some kids that I'm like, oh, wow, where are their parents? And why do they let them talk to them that way is foreign to me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that goes into another, um, I had coffee with a girlfriend yesterday um, who is very much in the parental camp that I'm in as far as like, we need to parent these kids because it's not the other way around. And it's more important today than it ever has been before because of all the things we've talked about on multiple podcasts, what these kids are exposed to, um, the amount of just ridiculousness that is just, it's, it's flooding them. And then you have the technology piece that is just really hard, you know, in, in, but we have to, as parents, if we're not on them, they will go into this vacuum of, they will talk to their parents whatever they, way they want. They will get whatever they want. I want, I mean, my daughters are 9 and 11. They don't have phones. They're not getting phones anytime in my foreseeable future. Now, that's something that my husband and I decided, that Alan and I decided that that is not what I want our girls to be exposed to. However, they're getting it inadvertently. Mm -hmm. And because a, most of their friends have phones and um, it's... I'm just going to kind of leave it there, but I've just seen a lot of parents. And again, these are my kid, my daughter's friends. So whether they're nine years old and friends of, or whether they're 11 years old and friends of over the years, I mean, it probably started a couple of years ago with, wow, where do they get the right to talk to their parents that way? Mm -hmm. How do you stop that? How do you catch that? Well, so if they're already in that level of talking to their parents, it's been something that's been going on for a period of time. So that they perhaps were not raised in a way where respect was part of the upbringing. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, the, so the respect was never fully there. But then you have to look at the parent. And it's not saying it's not about the parent's fault, but you got to look at the parent and see well, how yeah, does the parent because talk they're to the, the child. Parents. Yeah. So you got to see how the parent talks to the child, what the, what the child hears the parent talking with mm -hmm. others, how they hear them talking to others and talking to their spouse, you know, their mom or their mm -hmm. dad, right? How they talk to each other is so important because then this is where, you know, kids can grow up and then start treating their spouse regardless of, you know, uh, wife or husband or, you know, whatever way it goes. And they just start becoming that even bully to a lot of, you know, women, like women who are pants in the family mm -hmm. th that are leading more with their masculine mm -hmm. that have that more, you know, wrapped around the little finger kind of thing. That's right. Really unhealthy. Right. And so then it's, um, they can even be bullying, you know, yeah. em emasculating, right. Yeah. The, the man. And so that's obviously, they could see that growing up with a domineering mother. Mm -hmm. And now they've become the very thing that perhaps they were either afraid of or judged when they were growing up. And they became the very parent that they've been judging all along. It's, it's, it's a society thing. It's not anyone, you know, I, 
my hat goes off to everybody who has made marriages work. At least my kids are in the nine and 11 range. Obviously when the, our Alan's big kids were older or were younger, um, I was the stepmom. Mm-hmm. So it was a different dynamic. Um, but now to see whether parents are together or whether they're divorced, I don't know. I can't even imagine the divorced piece because it's hard enough trying to figure out how to co-parent with when you're ha- happily married, mm-hmm. you know, there's still kids and you still have a, a, a different, you know, input, right? So the way I would raise my kids, had it been my way, I would be homeschooling by now, mm-hmm. yeah, but I'm married. So there's compromise and there's, you know, trying to understand, but at the heart of it all, we love our, we love our girls. Um, and I'm just going to do that automaticness for everybody else because I don't know their dynamics. So we're mm-hmm. just going to operate from a space of if you're married, let's just say you're happily married, but parenting is no joke because mm-hmm. if you're married, you still have two opinions on how to properly parent. And if you're divorced, then the dynamics get even potentially more complicated. Cause I have not seen, um, I've probably seen two, um, good, uh, <laughs> What did they say? Consciously uncoupling or right? Yes. What was that nice way to put divorce? Right. Um, actually, one of one of Stacey Mia's really good friends from Vegas was very in a just a wonderful. You really can't ask for a better scenario. So it does absolutely happen, um, but it also goes the other way. So you know the it's really important in um, you know kind of having this conversation about you know how you're talking to yourself first, but then how you're talking to others and how others are talking to you. Um, Just a new level of awareness. Um, Because again, at the heart of it all, and I I will bring Alan up because this is something that, um, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. The premise of it all is, would I ever say anything to hurt him? And the answer is, of course not, right? And him to me. All right, well, if that's the foundation, all right, now we've got to get into... <clears throat> well, when he says this, I feel that, or I say this and he feels that. And, and that, you know, that's just deeper levels of, you know, digging in and making your relationship stronger is to see all of that, right? You can do it in a relationship. There's no better place to do that than in a relationship. So for people who are in a relationship, the best person to come at this is the person you're in a relationship yeah. with. They're the mirror. Yeah. And I think we need to do a deeper dive on what that looks, the reflection and how, um, when you start to really comprehend that and understand it, um, God, all the lessons, how you speak to others, how you let them speak to you, how it feels going both ways and, and then, and then unpacking it and going, mm-hmm. wait, do we like this? Is this good? If not shift it, change it. It's, it's so, I don't want to say it's easy. It's pretty easy to do just awareness. Yeah. Well, it depends on where you start from, but yes, <laughs> whether it's easy or not easy, you know, when it comes to this, but yes, but awareness absolutely makes it a lot easier to, to change. You know, one of the things I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Michigan and I don't know if it, I think it's kind of a Midwest thing, but just, um, manners, right? Etiquette, manners, pleases, and thank yous are just so ingrained. I mean, even when Eric was a baby, we're just so polite, you know, we're just really polite people, not to toot my own horn or our own horn, but it's just true. And so when he was first, you know, some of his first words, he was starting with pleases and thank yous because we just yeah. use it so naturally. Oh, so is Aurora. Right? Yeah. And I st- we yes. still use it today. Could you please do this? Could you, you know, thank you for doing that. It's just so in, in our languaging. And I see that missing in a lot of people, the ple- just the simple pleases and thank mm-hmm. yous put those in. That's like, to me, the, the, the easiest thing to do is to start using please. And thank you with your kids, mm-hmm. with your spouse, yeah. because this is why we end up taking each other for granted is because we're not just using the basic etiquette of pleases and thank yous and appreciation and gratitude and all these places that feels good and builds the relationship and strengthens the relationship with everybody in your life. So for sure. 
oh, you know, I live in I live in the Midwest now. Did you know that? Yeah. So we're in Northern Texas, but I got to tell you, so Dallas is a big city, obviously. Dallas is a big city. It has a sister city, Fort Worth. I love Fort Worth. You go into Fort Worth and the, the, the men, the boys, the hats, they open doors. Yes, ma'am. You know, no, thank you, please. I mean, and I will tell you, young boys, young boys, this little like opening doors. It's like that is what they're taught, and I love that. That is the biggest reason that we ended up moving here when we were going back and forth. And are we going to fix this house and flip it? Are we going to stay in Vegas? Like, what are we going to do? There was a couple months that we, you know, from well, August, September, October, November, so three months where we really went back and forth. And every time we came here. And this is such a good reminder for me as I'm like, where do I belong in the world? I love the kindness of people here. And I think it is a Midwest thing. I mean, I grew up in LA and my parents still drilled that into me because I drilled it into my kids. Um, it's just kindness mm -hmm. and manners and just and respect, respect, respect. Yeah. 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 Respect. I mean, please thank you. And I have the cutest video. I'm going to send it to you when we're done of Aurora's first words. Thank you. And she was like 14 months old and she was the cutest little thing. Mm -hmm. um, she started talking at 14 months old. So anyway, yeah, manners, something to be said about that. For sure. And you mentioned something earlier about when you're interacting with your spouse and you did it naturally, but that is using the I statements mm. instead of you make me feel so mad. It's like, Your fault. I feel mad right now. It's yeah. much different than you make me feel. Because now what you're doing is you're giving someone else, whether it's your spouse or your kids or whoever, you're now giving them the your power because now they're responsible for how you feel instead of taking responsibility for your feelings. If whatever they do to you makes you angry, then it's time to look and see, okay, well, anger is a button on me that they, that they like to push that button, but it's my feeling, right? Right. It's my feeling. And so if this is something that is a pattern around when they do this, I feel this way, right? Then you want to start to look in and at that and see, is this something that's actually much deeper than just when that button is pushed? Is there something living in there that perhaps how they say something feels disrespectful to me and I've got real issues around respect? Mm. And then, then I would say go to, well, how much are you respecting yourself, first off? Because if you're not talking respectfully internally, then that's going to be a natural attraction to other people speaking to you disrespectfully. So that's always the first place to look. If it's not there, then you go to the next place, you know, and then have you had people in your life in the past, especially, you know, growing up that talk to you disrespectfully. And so when someone is speaking to you disrespectfully or they're not really, but you're taking it as disrespect, because that's another big one that can happen. They're not really being disrespectful, but you're so sensitive to disrespect that it's pulling up that old energy around feeling disrespected growing up or wherever it comes from. So there's all sorts of ways in which to, to do this. So even when, if I feel, you know, I don't have a lot of people who talk disrespectfully to me, <laughs> but yeah. if they do, you know, I, I will, and I'm pretty gracious when it comes to people being un, unaware so I, I don't move immediately into taking it personally, because especially depending on the context of the relationship, but I will, I will, uh, I'll check in first. I won't just immediately react, but I will check in first and I'll maybe give some warnings and then I might, <laughs> you know, whatever. And that's usually enough if that happens, if that comes up, like even with this person that I ended the coaching relationship with, I mean, I kept saying like, you need to change your tone. It, it was, but it was just, it was just coming at me like. Bent. intentionally coming at you, you know, yeah. and it's like, 
Um, Mm-mm. okay, you're, you're not even listening to me. All you're doing is you're yelling at me and you're not stopping. You're not stopping yourself from yelling. But I was warning signs and I'm like, hand signals, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> all this. And I'm just like, okay, I'm ending this call. I'm ending this call. Like, and that's that. And I said, I gave him the warning I was ending the call. Not like I just end, right? So, so again, it's, you got to work with this stuff. It's not a black and white subject, but using I statements is really important. I feel this way. When you do this, I feel this way. Mm -hmm. You can say that, but not you make me feel this way because then what you're doing is you're giving your power away and they don't have, you know, the power to, well, they don't have the power to make you feel anything unless you're giving them permission to do so. Yep. In some of the most complicated pieces, and this gets really tricky, this is next level is some of these are truly, when we were talking about the different levels of consciousness a couple podcasts ago, Mm -hmm. this one is buried. And it is, especially with people with really tricky childhoods, um, they are, they're legitimately, and this is again, relationships. This is your significant other. This is your best friend. This is your, you know, these are people that you're really, really close to. It could be even, you know, a parent child relationship as adults which is they don't, some people have no idea how they show up. They just don't. Mm -hmm. And so then as the receiver, your job is to go, where are they at? And to walk away. Sometimes you're not going to have, when, when someone that you're with, and again, significant other, parent, child, adult parent child uh you see this a lot sibling relationships those ones that have patterns that threaded going back to birth if you are if you're doing the work and you're kind of way more in the conscious realm and you're aware this is really good work for you to be able to support someone else in their you know how are they um going to kind of clear out some of this and how do you talk to them about it if they're unaware of it so the best thing we can do if you're on the receiver end, and again, all of these really close knit relationships is when they're um, coming at you with energy that you're like, whoa, wow. Instead of, and this is next level, instead of giving it back to them, easy to do, especially when you, you got old patterns, um, is to really go, okay, I can see they're in their hot spot right now. And is it time to talk to them about anything? So the best thing you could do is maybe do some active listening. Really do some active listening. That's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole other podcast, right? Active listening. That's the other flip. That's the flip side of this, this part. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is active listening and then really do some deep breaths. You're the Andrew Huberman, that little podcast that you, that he did about the. Yeah is so powerful the physiological side yeah i mentioned that in the last parenting class and sent a link that you should put that in the link in the description below this video um just in case we don't want to forget um but no it's 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 it is it's your physio physiology you want to so again you know when you're in a situation where you're like i am feeling i'm feeling Whatever you're feeling, you know, activated, agitated, angry, scared, you know, all the words, whatever that is that gets you to get into more of a fight or flight state, that's the easiest way to go, okay, this is what Sonner and Lisa were talking about. Take a, yeah. through your nose, actually. The, the, the physiological sigh is you breathe in like twice. And your exhale is longer than the inhale, mm-hmm. but you, you, you know, you draw it in. I don't think it matters whether it's your nose or your mouth, but you, you draw it in and then you just do a little bit more. Cause what you're doing is you're, he expanding talks about your, it. it. You're expanding your bronchial little, tubes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And your lungs and, uh, and they're, you know, you're filling them up completely. A lot of people breathe shallow and so forth. I don't want to get off on breathing too much, but so the, <laughs> it's it's physiological, so sigh, physiological sigh is,
Just remember the exhale is longer than the inhale and it's a longer inhale with a short one to follow and then a long exhale. But yes, I will put the link in the description. We'll put the link in the description. And I, I'll just say just because of the smoking thing, because it's so close in my rear view mirror, um, you know, a lot of smokers smoke to, they think they're calming themselves down. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things that I realized in this a- Andrew Huberman breathing exercise, I'm like, yes, yeah, okay, why well, I, I actually did know that when I was starting to really unpack the truth about smoking, what it physiologically does, and all these misconceptions that we've been taught, mostly via programming that comes off the TV from the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, ah, the marble man, right? It's mm-hmm. all relaxing. Oh, actually, it's a stimulant. And just that short breathing is what you're doing. There's no relaxing part to it. Your body goes into a physiological different place and you think you're smoking to calm the stress down, but it doesn't work like that. So this exercise, I I mean, everybody can just do it, try it right now and you will go, oh, I feel so much better. Breath is a powerful tool we have at our disposal all the time. <laughs> so it's the now it's the importance of mindful language, right? Really mm-hmm. recognizing how to become more mindful when it comes to our languaging, to be clear in how we're speaking, to be, you know, more coming from that positive place. Now I get we have conversations that are not going to be positive, but being mindful in those places to where we can communicate in a respectful way, in a, you know, um, here's the thing. Oftentimes when people get into some of these more serious things, they just focus on the negative and pointing out all the things that they've been bugged by for the past, however long it's been. And what's important is to sprinkle some positive things in there. If you really want to talk to somebody in a way that they can receive it, Mm -hmm. You have to sprinkle it with things that you can point out that they might be doing really well. Oh, yeah. So you're not just throwing off your bullet list of all the things they're doing that bother you or that you feel hurt by even. It's like, I love how you do this. And then you go into with a whole nother descriptive praise, which, you know, is part of it. Really tell, when you tell people specifically what you think, feel is positive about them, it's much more effective than just telling them, good job. Now, sometimes it's just going to come out that way. Good job, great job, all that kind of stuff. That's just part of it. But especially when you're really in a one-to-one conversation with somebody, especially your child or your spouse or a close friend, it's like, I really loved how you communicated to me with a softness. That felt really good to me. See, now what you're doing is you're actually giving them information on what pleases you. And you're tearing down the wall. Yeah. Any wall that may be up, it's just a vulnerability. It it helps them on the receiving end to vulnerability. Oh, oh, Mm -hmm. I'm safe here. Yep. And, And so, but if you just come at it, you're always so harsh with me. You're always... For sure, all you're using always <laughs> and always. then harsh. <laughs> so find the places that you want to reinforce that positive reinforcement. Find those places where you can give descriptive praise to your children. It could be, I loved how you stacked the, the dishwasher with all the plates going this way and all facing the same way. Well, my kids don't do that yet, but I can't wait until they do. <laughs> look for the time. First of all, you got to teach them that, but then I look just, for the time that they do, right? Yeah. yeah. And then reinforce it. Like, Absolutely. Right now. Absolutely. And, and then see how long it lasts. If it, if you haven't, if that might not just be enough to get them to stack them that way every time. I have such a great just example of that. So Aurora, had, I, I love her. Um, Stacy's so easy. So Aurora her writing has been really like, what are you saying? You have daddy doctor writing. You need to write this. You need to learn how to write clean so other people can, especially you're in school, right? So you need to, so we know what you're writing so we could see, are you spelling correctly? Is your math right? Like, so 
I've been working on this with her. And I, just right out, right out on the kitchen counter, I left it here because I was like, oh, I can't wait to like blow her up and just give her all like, wow, this is amazing. Not only are you writing clean and I can read it, but your grammar is perfect. Your spelling is awesome. I mean, just 100%. Yeah. And I can't wait to share it with her. I wanted to do that this morning, but it got shuffled around on the counter. But I will do it when she gets home. And yeah. when you do things like that, especially, I, I know this about Aurora, it will cause her to go, really? Yeah. All right, I could do it again. I could probably do it better. Yeah. And, you know, and then you're winning. Was- even as detailed as look at how much you you curved your S's. Yes. Because that's even going drilling down even deeper to a super specific thing. Because they we remember the stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, so every, then when she goes to write her S's, she'll be doing it really clear. I mean, I don't know if S's are her thing. You know, <laughs> I'm just it using doesn't matter. Really- you know, whatever, like, because her, her math, it was actually her, her numbers that were, I can't, is your is your math even correct? I don't know because I can't read the numbers. And so um, everything was so great because there were numbers involved and there was grammar involved. And I was just like, wow, when did that happen? That was like last week that we discussed it and not in a negative way, in an empowering way. You know, hey, I think you can get a much better grade if anybody could read what you're writing. (laughs) So... And she listened. Oh, she listened. It was so good. And when so maybe like, not the dishes in the dishwasher all stacked perfectly, yeah. but but you know, just the simplest of examples, I, right? And so even when a, you know you're working with your child, and maybe they don't have whatever it is that you're working with them on perfectly yet, but man, go in there with that descriptive praise and point out where they are getting better, point out the improvement, which is going to be beneficial for the self-talk on yourself as well, because what we do in here, we do out here. And so the more we practice going out with others and in with ourselves, it will naturally start to show up the other way. So as we talk more respectfully, or we talk more positively and affirmatively with, you know, praise and gratitude for others, it's going to naturally filter into ourselves as well and vice versa. So it all works together. It's all connected. And all so connected, all connected. So challenge that self-talk. Mm-hmm. And a way to be mindful is to challenge that negative self-talk. Catch it when you're being hard on yourself, when you're being aggressive. And then just ask yourself, is this really helping me? Mm-hmm. And how long have I been doing this? Oh, I've been doing it for, I don't know, 20 years. And where has it gotten me? To where I'm still doing, I'm still talking harshly about the same thing I haven't been able to conquer or whatever it might be. It's because, yeah, because you're in this maybe inner drill sergeant Mm. that is just so aggressive and it's not working. You need to find another way and Mm. how you talk to yourself is going to be part of that way, right? Yeah. Second way, be mindful of your exaggeration. If you find yourself in an exaggerated place, just catch and correct. There goes the exaggeration. Right? He always does that. Okay, yeah. not always. I'm never going to ever. <laughs> That's right. And then the, this is something that came up around the catastrophizing. We, d- we did an example of worst case scenario, a podcast on worst case scenario. Mm, right? So good. And so a catastrophizer is what they're doing is that's all they're looking at is the worst case scenario. And it kind of lives as the foundation to how they live their life. That's not what we were talking about. We're like calling out, what is this worst case scenario that you're, you know, that you're contemplating? And oftentimes there isn't even one, they're just sitting in fear. So that's a little different than what I'm talking, what we're talking about here. And that is if you are always looking at the worst case scenario and not bringing in the realism and the other best case scenario, like we did in the Mm. podcast, then you're going to get stuck probably in catastrophizing language. And that's where you want to reroute that catastrophizing language to something that's more powerful. Like I can handle this challenge, Mm -hmm. you know, it's here. And if I can't handle it, I know there's someone who I can talk to that can help me with this challenge instead Mm -hmm. of just sitting in my own, you know, space 
running all this catastrophe going on. You know, you I just think of the um, meme with um, Leslie Nielsen in front of the house. Okay. <laughs> and it's just, you know, whatever. Bombs away. Blowing up behind him. You know, I think everyone's seen that one by now. So good. Yeah. Perfect and then, example. Practice empathetic and respectful communication with others. And, you know, there's a saying that says we often treat the ones we love the most the worst, worst. because they're, we just become so comfortable that all of our stuff <laughs> yeah. doesn't, you know, all those positive filters don't come in to kind of, you know, correct us if we're just used to calling somebody in a negative derogatory way. And then that becomes the natural. But so if, if it's well, that- and if it's going out, it's coming back. So if if it's yeah. coming out of your mouth, it's coming back to you. So that goes that plays into the whole thing. Yeah. What you and- say to yourself, you're saying to others, or what you're saying to others, guarantee you're saying to yourself, yeah. pretty much. And so, and a one way to kind of checkpoint that, and you you mentioned it earlier, is that how you're talking. Well, you can do it anyway. How you're talking to yourself. Would you talk to someone you really cared about that way? And if not, time to correct that Mm self-talk. How you're talking to your kids. If you were in a group of people that you respected, would you talk to that way to your child? Mm. That's a good checkpoint. Always, because that's a... (laughs) Yeah. And then when you are talking to your spouse or someone in, in that vein, partner of some sort... Would you talk to somebody who, um, you know, you don't live with <laughs> and, mm. and care about, would you talk to them that way as well? And if it's, an, if it's a resounding no, it's time to correct. It's time to clean up some of that, that communication style. Right? Yeah. Yep. Paying attention. Yeah. And then the last one, which comes off the heels of our last podcast, and that was, is take pauses before responding. Mm-hmm. So when you feel stressed or overwhelmed, because remember this negative languaging and these types of things we're talking about, it increases your stress levels. And then the languaging becomes more intense and then the stress becomes more intense and then the languaging becomes more intense. And it's this vicious cycle that just continues. That's why the stress levels just continue to ramp up. So the best thing you can do is take an Andrew Huberman breath. There's your pause. Yeah. Take a pause. Take a pause. And even just that moment, what does it take? 20 seconds to take a breath like that? 10 maybe? Is enough to you know, change your physiology, which actually helps the circulation in your brain and it brings down your stress levels. So use that opportunity to just take a breath. Yeah. Take well, breath. and that's what you did. You talked about in the last podcast, right? Mm-hmm. When you were sitting there at the uh, uh, station, what is it? Where you were at? The station. With your car. Oh, God. The inspection station. Inspection. I, that's what I was Okay, for. it's official. I can't get an inspection on the car. <laughs> anyway, yes. Right. With with the sweet little autistic kid. Um, I So I have to talk about this because this is your pause, right? So I'm starting to laugh about five different times I had to go get an inspection to finally find on the last time the reason why I have to take the tint off my window. But I was very calm. Actually, I had to wait. I was on the phone with you. Mm -hmm. I had to wait an hour. It was so funny because we were on the phone and (laughs) you were pulling up to the inspection station and I, you know, it was happening live and in real time. And they said, it's going to be about an hour. And w- is that okay? And you're just like, yes, I'll go over here. And I, I said to you, I said, the saga continues. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. This is, but this is, honestly, it is that it was universe kind of giving me an opportunity to work on patience and understanding. And so I finally get, I finally get up to the front of the line. Great. I get this wonderful man who explained to me, like, look, they're coming after us. It's the last year. Like, next year when I go to get the stupid car inspected, there's no safety. They're not checking any of this. 
So before this new law gets implemented, the inspectors are coming after these inspection stations and it's a $2,500 fine to the, to the person who does the inspection and a $10,000 fine to the business. To which I said, I'm going to take the tint off my window. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I, and you know what? There was no energy for me, right? It was, I was very patient. I utilized that time to have a good conversation with my girlfriend. And, you know, and then I got there and I was very relaxed and I had no emotion and I didn't come in agitated and I had all the, even I waited an hour. I could have gotten that information right when I got there, but I had to exercise patience and then understanding. And do I really want somebody to get a $2,500 fine? Cause my tint, no, I'm going to take the, take the car and get the tin off. I figured it all out. It's not a big deal. And you know, I don't want anybody to get fined. Even that poor little autistic boy, he wasn't going to jail. He just would have gotten a big fine that would have just been devastating to him. And I don't want to hurt anybody. Well, he might have been catastrophizing inside. <laughs> he was definitely catastrophizing for sure. Yeah. Um, isn't that funny? So <laughs> there's the end of the, the inspection. Yeah. I'll but let everybody you, know. Yeah, when you, when you told the story last week, that was the big thing and was one of the also kind of the lessons too is speak, take a moment, pause Yes. before you speak from an emotional place. Right. Right. When right. you speak from an emotional place and there's just no bringing mindfulness into it is usually where we're creating a bigger mess for ourselves. Yep. So, yep. And, and on yeah. that note, and I'm a prayer warrior and an excellent manifester. And I will tell you, I hit my VFLE, FLFE. I did this whole manifestation. I'm going to the inspection station, getting inspected. It's going to be great. And I get there and you know what? The prayer that I was praying for to happen didn't happen. Guess what? That's okay too. Because sometimes what we really, 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 really want is not the way it's supposed to go. So, but it was all this whole, it, what an experience over a tinted window. Isn't it so funny? Like over nothing, but lots of lessons. Lots of lessons. And that's a lot of the times how lessons come in to our awareness is through these littler things, yeah. the less important things. They can definitely come through the important things too, but get them on the less important things. Learn the lessons on the less important, less higher, yes. you know, there's higher risk situations and there's lower risk situations. Get, you know, really build that foundation on these smaller things where you have opportunities to be patient. You have opportunities to speak kindly. You have opportunities to um, have, you know, pleases and thank yous inserted into your, into your, just your everyday languaging. Because all these things add up and they create momentum over time. And the rewards, if you will, or the, the positive benefits from all this really starts to come in. And it's like, wow, you know, this I don't have to make this so complicated. Mm -hmm. I can simplify it. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. And there you okay. go. Yeah. So just remember, we'll end on, on this. Choose your words wisely. And use your language as a healthy tool to improve not only your own stress and well-being, but those of others as well. Absolutely. Be kind to yourself. Uh, you got a little bit of homework. We look forward to seeing you again next week. And thank you again for watching. And again, like, subscribe, share if you're so inclined. Thanks. <laughs>